Welcome to Bridge the Gap with hosts Lucas McCurdy and Joshua Crisp, a podcast dedicated to informing, educating, and influencing the future of housing and services for seniors. Powered by Markenta. Welcome to Bridge the Gap podcast. Today, my buddy Josh, uh, Joshua Chris, co-host on Bridge the Gap. We're here with a very, very exciting guest, and we're just hoping that he doesn't hijack our podcast and basically take it over, make it his own, and then just leave us in the dust. So welcome Steve Moran from Senior Housing Forum. Thank you very much, and I might very well hijack it. We'll just have to see where it goes. <laughs> it's going to Let's see how good your questions are. That's true. Yeah. That's it's going to happen. Probably yeah. not as good as yours would be. So um, Steve, we've been following you for a lot longer than you've known us. Um, and uh, I had the fortune to talk to you at Nick earlier this year. One of the big things that I think that has attracted me to you has really just been your willingness to be authentic. I think there's so many people out there that really just kind of want to check the boxes and consider that task done and move on to the next one. And you don't do that. And so what's the genesis of that? What what makes you tick in that way? So I'd say it's a good question and I'm not sure I know exactly how to answer that. Um, I would say that I'm convinced that you always learn more by um, questioning your assumptions and thinking about things and saying, how can I do things in new and different ways? Uh, but partly it was brought on by the readers. Um, I started blogging or I'd been at it for maybe a year when uh, the big emeritus story that may have even been, before, you, I'm sure you know, I remember, remember that. I remember and, well, actually. you know, the whole thing just blew up and emeritus looked really bad. And pretty much the, the conventional was was that we just needed to feel badly for Meredith. And I did feel badly for it because it was really an unfair hatchet piece. On the other hand, there were lessons to be learned there, right? Mm -hmm. And so rather than just say, oh, poor us, you know, we, it was really important to say, okay, what does this actually mean for the industry? So I'm really big on to, so what are the lessons do you learn? Because you learn a lot more from failure than you do from uh, successes, right? Exactly, exactly. So, so that was one of those, let's talk about that yeah. because you lived through that, you covered a lot of stories surrounding that. So what are some of the lessons that you think we pulled away from that as an industry? So. Uh, I'm not really sure I want to try to go into exactly, you know, <laughs> did they do wrong? Was it fair or not? I will tell you one thing for sure. I think that maybe the biggest lesson for everybody is uh, a lesson of crisis management. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably the most important lesson is that you need to bring in outside expertise. They tried to do it all themselves. And I think that in doing that, they did great damage to what was already a very difficult situation. Some of it was public damage. More of it was probably internal damage where um, I, you know, I remember talking to the person who was getting all these horrible, hateful emails. She worked for the company and she had to respond to all these. And I would have gone home so depressed if I had to do that every day because I think at times she had hundreds of these. And if, if it had been, they'd hired somebody else to respond to that, they would have had six or eight canned response and they would have sent them out and it would have been no skin off their back. And so I think having experts to take care of that is probably the biggest lesson. Um, I think there were also some lessons perhaps about documentation. And uh, I think the other lesson is we've just got to be so careful about caring. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the things, and I would like to know what you think about this, because this, this is kind of my own personal feeling and observation. I'm in the space 13 years now. So we do, I don't think we hear a lot of bad stories, but it seems like the stories we often hear are bad stories, but I think it's, it's, there's not enough good stories. So in other words, there's so many good stories happening, but I feel like we do a bad job of telling our story in the in industry. And I feel like uh, the, the few bad stories that prop up, they could be easily drowned out and we could better control our industry's message. But how do you feel about that? Well, it's great that you asked that question, actually, because um, I'm actually going to do a session at Argentum where we're going to talk about that very issue. Uh, we don't do a good enough job in telling our good stories for sure. And um, again, it's one of those things that takes some expertise. And there are really sort of two parts to that. One is in the local marketplace. There are some companies that actually do a really, really good job. There's a company called Primrose Retirement. And they've got one guy, uh, Dan Similoff, and he's, last year I think he did a million dollars worth of earned media, meaning that, that stories wow. that he got into the press and they put some dollar numbers to that. 
If you're going to go nationally, which we really need more of those, um, it probably means hiring some consultants who are going to go out who have contacts in the national media and can actually get those stories out there. And they know how to write them, they know how to tell the stories and those kinds of things. And we're just not very good about doing that. Yeah, so I, I feel the same way, Lucas. We've talked about that. I said, yeah. We visit, you visit, I know a ton, more than I do, senior care communities, you see the awesome things going on, yes. and we just don't see that nationally. Exactly. So. Well, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the business, because I'm seeing it play out, and I'm getting to meet the, the caregivers that are doing this work, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is not at all about what I thought that this industry and these communities would actually be like. These people are, are amazing, that, and, the, and the stories that are here are amazing. Yeah, but... Uh, I think part of the challenge though is you go in there and you say, man, this is really a great experience, right? But is it actually a tellable story? And I think that that's the key is you've got to think of it in terms of what's a real tellable story. You know, there are only about six story types, right? But it's sort of, you, you set the stage, you've got some drama, here's how you think about it, here's, um, here is what happened, here maybe were the setbacks, and here's the wonderful, uh, uh, outcome, right? And and so you've got to think in those co in that context. It's got to be tellable. It's got to be simple. It's got to be short enough. It's got to be colorful enough, bright enough. I mean, there's so many things that need to be thought about. And so it really takes somebody who's got some expertise in telling stories to make it happen. Exactly. Well, I think uh, to give you just a plug, I think that you're really good at telling our stories in the in the industry, which is why I'm attracted to your articles and your emails and stuff that come out every day. And I think. You know, I think everybody has a moment when they get hooked. <laughs> uh, and one of the moments with you, for me, that I was hooked at was a story that you told about where you said, I'm sorry. <laughs> you had to apologize. And you were very open and authentic about that. And uh, so how did Senior Housing Forum begin for you? And where is Senior Housing Forum going? So how did it begin? I guess... If you'd talked to me before I ever published the first article, I would have described something that looks honestly a lot like um, uh, senior housing news. But as I started writing and publishing and uh, sort of looked at the things that gave me passion and looked at what was resonating with the readers, it, it evolved into this editorial, we're a great business, how do we get better? What lessons do we learn? So we're going to continue to uh, tackle that. Uh, one of the things I'm doing is podcasting. Excellent. And so I've, this will be sort of the third version of the podcast that I'll do as part of this. Um, I'm, since we're sort of jointly, you should see all the cameras and microphones <laughs> recording this here. Collaboration. And, um, and then um, I'm also doing some leadership development stuff with my good friend Denise Scott. And we're looking at some more uh, leadership development kinds of things. And uh, the goal really is to be able to help people get better. Um, I would tell you that one of the things that makes me really sad in the industry right now is over the last few months, I've talked to several people who are really, really good leaders who made job changes because they thought it was going to advance their career. And they ended up going from a okay job typically to what they thought was going to be a great job that turned out to be a terrible job where they were treated very badly by the people they were working for. So it sounds really bad, except that the people who were treating them badly, they weren't bad people. They were just, they were good people who didn't know how to manage, how to lead effectively. And so I think that, that we need to, more than anything else, is really spending time on how to be great leaders in the industry. It's probably, it's more important than than the, the human capital stuff, it's more important than the occupancy stuff because the human capital stuff and the occupancy stuff will all get better uh, if we can just look at how to lead people, how to make people love coming to work every day. So you're going to be doing some of that. So Absolutely. is that going to be online? Is it going to be in classroom setting? How, what, what do you envision that? So like? there, there are two things that I'm working on. There are actually three things I'm working on right now. I'm not sure whether well, a couple of them I know will come to fruition. So in June, I am keynoting at Leading Age Washington. And the title of my uh, uh, talk is how to be the leader that everybody wants to follow. And I've done a number of keynotes. I'm most excited about this. I think that it has the, the ability to be most transformative. 
Um, I'm running a, a roundtable right now with a group of executives where we're working on human capital. Uh, in August, we're planning on doing three one-day uh, events in different parts of the country where a little bit different focus, but we're going to ask the question of how do we create an amazing customer experience for senior living consumers and prospects. And then the other thing I'm sort of playing with is how do I actually, uh, how do we actually help uh, executive directors who are maybe struggling get better. So I kind of got this notion that it would be a lot better to do intensive coaching with executive directors who are struggling, even if it costs you ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, than to go out and fire them and replace them with somebody else who is also struggling. So I'm still just playing with what that might look like and whether I can make that work or not. Uh, so we'll have to see. That's exciting. Yeah, I love that. So I think I share uh, your belief and your passion that that's a real secret ingredient that our industry is missing um, to make some magic happen, to maybe forward those better stories. Um, you know, and I would love to see too, I think there's one of the challenges, you know, we, I, I think at the regional level, at the C-suite level, we go to these conferences and we get energized and then we go back to our communities or the administrators go back to their communities and then nothing happens. So how do we create systems that are easy nuggets enough to take those, let those administrators and let those regionals go back and empower their teams. Um, so I would love to, to continue this discussion and, and talk more about that and us broadcast uh, because I'm assuming this will be open t and this is not by invitation only. People will be able to subscribe and well, so the the one day there will be a charge for that. Mm -hmm. um, the coaching stuff that'll be something that we charge for. We don't know what that's going to look like yet. Not even 100% sure I can make that happen. I've got too many more ide good ideas than I have time and energy sure. to do. Uh, but it's an area I have a great passion for. So, um, and certainly we'll continue writing about these things. And you know, if you were, if if we were, if I were interviewing you, the one question I would ask, be wanting to ask you relative to this is, what are you actually doing? for leadership development for your regionals and your executive directors. Most, I, I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot, mostly because we're out of time, so you're going to yeah. get, you're gonna get I'm away getting with off this. the hook. <laughs> you're yes. going to get off the hook. But, yes. but, the, but, the, but the reality is, is in most organizations, there's not much intentionality. I know that there's some raw, typically a, there's mm -hmm. an annual meeting where there's mm -hmm. sort of some raw, raw, and maybe a little bit of training, but once a year just isn't good enough. Right. So, I agree with um, you. So I think that's a great question. We do need to have a episode two yes. to talk of that. Put me yeah. on the hot seat put some other operators on the hot seat but you know I think it's a challenge I don't think it's a it has to do with the desire it, it has to happen with how do we balance this and we are we making it. this a priority and and what are we doing for it so it's yeah. great yeah and I would just argue that it ought to be your highest priority I agree um, and I think that what happens is that the the, the tactic, tactical stuff gets in the way mm -hmm. and the strategic stuff doesn't happen Absolutely. Well, the conversation has been good. Well, uh, Steve, it's always a pleasure to get to see you at these conferences. And uh, just, you know, you're the kind of guy that when you see, you know, me and Josh, we're doing the podcast thing. Like, you're not, oh, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. I'm going to stay away from that. You're willing to collaborate. Sure. And we're excited. I think more good people doing podcasts, it's kind of like the tide rises all boats. Um, and I, I really think that the way, especially in an industry that is so filled with a need and care, is that we collaborate. Like, let's not, no one has some magical secret, magical formula that we can only do a podcast or you can only do a podcast. Let's do it together. Sure. And let's help each other out. Out, and 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 then that way we move we move the narrative in a direction that's helpful to everybody exactly so love it um, we'll definitely be connecting with Steve in our show notes Steve is very active on social he's uh, probably I would argue the most active on social he's got a very large Facebook group um, he's got an incredible LinkedIn audience um, as well we do too and so I'm looking forward to leveraging actually our entire network which would com probably be tens of thousands of people yep. at this point. Um, it's exciting that we can get good information out to the people that we care about to help them out too. So thank you, Steve, so, so much. We're very grateful for your time. And um, for, uh, for those that are listening, please go online if you have questions for Steve. And if you have questions for us, we'll make sure that we engage. And another great episode of Bridge the Gap. <laughs>